Welcome everyone to this recorded conversation ahead of FIA's upcoming course, Contemporary Spirituality, starting in 2024. Um, I'm really excited to be in conversation with Hannah today. Hannah is a familiar face at Advaya, um, and if you have been following Advaya for a while, then you will know that Hannah has been the curator of Kinship, um, two iterations of a wonderful multi-teacher course. Um, in some ways, I guess this is this is kind of a continuation of that. So if anyone has followed that um, course and wanted to join it but couldn't, this is your chance to hop on board that kind of collective inquiry that's held really beautifully by Hannah. Um, and so just a short introduction, and then I'll let Hannah introduce um, the course, Contemporary Spirituality. But Hannah, um, Hannah Close, is a writer, photographer, curator, and researcher exploring philosophy, ecology, culture, and being alive in a world of relations. Currently, Hannah is making a documentary um, and also um, writes on her Substack. All of this information will be linked um, below. Uh, but for the purposes of this conversation, Hannah is the curator of our upcoming multi-teacher course, Contemporary Spirituality, which is also available for registration at advaya.life. So if you would like to come on board this journey, please do join us. But in this conversation, we'll be kind of touching on the key themes and questions of the course um, and sort of um, explaining what we will be getting into, why we will be getting into those things and why you should join us. Um, so Hannah, please do introduce the course a little bit and tell us a bit about um, why you decided to kind of convene this really um, ambitious course. <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. Um, so, I mean, the full title of the course is Contemporary Spirituality, Meaning and Mysticism in the Modern Age. Um, and it's, it's basically a deep dive into the ways in which spirituality, which is obviously an enormous topic that contains so much that cannot be contained in one course, obviously, how that's interacting with Contemporary culture isn't a phrase people usually use. I would say modernity. Um, so it's it's the ways in which spirituality is becoming mainstream, the ways in which spirituality is being altered by things like technology, science, um, anything in kind of mainstream or pop culture, um, or even those kind of subcultures peripheral to that. Um, and I mean, the course came about because there's a lot of talk of different spiritual traditions and subcultures. For example, eco-spirituality is obviously on the rise because of the climate crisis. Um, but there's no broad conversation on, hang on a minute, this is happening. You know, something that was once in the margins and people would say, oh, that's just woo-woo or that's just, you know, whatever, has suddenly, you know, Hit, hit the mainstream and by that I mean you know in, in mainstream newspapers and news outlets uh, you know it dominates internet culture um, so I find that really fascinating and I thought it would be it feels very timely to have a conversation um, kind of zooming out and zooming in I mean the course will zoom in on various different you know parts of this of this topic um, but the general idea is to kind of take a step back, take stock of, of what's working, what's not working. And obviously that's entirely subjective, but to just gather basically around these themes um, and see how we can move forward. Thank you for that very brief description of the course. Um, I think what's important to note is that the, the course is, I guess like ideally, you know, attended by people who are interested in these topics, but also, you know, open and friendly to people who have never kind of really thought about these themes as there'll be a lot of speakers and teachers going in depth on, on these things. So you can expect to kind of come in with um, 
not too much knowledge, but, you know, gain a lot from the course, but also people who are really interested in these questions already and are maybe spirituality practitioners or, um, I guess, affiliated with religious organizations who are interested in thinking about these kind of, uh, these topics in more contemporary, like what it means now at this point in time. Um, and who want to come together and explore these questions together. So, and, and I know that this this course will have kind of holding sessions for people to discuss, and you know, people can discuss also like not um, not live and do, in the discussion forums. Um, so, just wanting to say that um, it's not only open to people who are interested in this super niche topic, but I mean, I guess not super niche since it's not mainstream, but you know, um, yeah, it's yeah. um. It's also, you don't need to be like a theologian to, you know, to take this course. It's really, it's really, it's really about meaning. Um, and spirituality is a way in which we find meaning, right? And we all, we can all relate to that on some level. Um, so yeah, just wanted to add that. Yeah. And I mean, that leads nicely to the first question, which is, um, I guess, the the center of, of this conversation, but also one of the centers of this course, which is... Um, the phrase, the meaning crisis. Um, I think it really succinctly sort of explains a lot of problems and like ailments of the current times. I wanted you to kind of explain the origin of, of this phrase, who it comes from, um, and also tell us a bit about um, what it means and, and why kind of the course on contemporary spirituality really is um, an inquiry into meaning capital M. <laughs> um, so the meaning crisis is attributed to John Favakey, um, who's going to be on the course, which is really exciting. He's got this fant fantastic series on YouTube called Awakening to the Meaning Crisis, which is a spiritual experience in and of itself. So I do recommend watching that. Um, so the meaning crisis, it's like there are lots of words at the moment for what's happening. Meta crisis, poly crisis, there's a mental health crisis, climate crisis, economic crisis, political, you know, the, the list goes on and on and on. And what Vivek is saying is that actually at the root of all of these crises, this, this overarching poly crisis is a crisis of meaning. Um, and then what does that mean, right? What, what, what even is meaning? Um, you know, and it's it's basically the idea that humans have been severed from sources of meaning that are healthy for them. So community, family, healthy relating, a healthy relationship with the mystical, which is obviously very important to this particular course, um, support structures, like the infrastructure for belonging in society has been sort of eroded as well. Um, and so meaning obviously still exists. People still find meaning in life. I don't know if life could even exist without meaning, but the ways in which we seek meaning have changed. Um, and obviously we'll talk about the kind of loss of religion um, and the secularization of society related to that. But now it's like meaning is found in, you know, toxic substances, addictions, abuse, um, you know, being constantly online or, you know, sources of meaning <clears throat> are still there, but they've substituted more nourishing sources of meaning. And of course, this is just my opinion, but it's one that's, you know, there's a consensus on this that, okay, we have, we have a crisis around this. And it's, it's really clear, particularly in the crisis of mental health, that there is a crisis of meaning um because people are not coping with with what's happening um not only on the level of of the very material you know things that are happening politically but on a much deeper deeper level you know and the line between inner life and outer life is blurring and blending um in so many ways so meaning is obviously something that's very, very subjective. Um, and we all have our own ways in which we both seek and create meaning, which is actually a very interesting point. You know, is meaning something that is 
inherently found in their universe, you know, an inherent property of, of, of life itself, or is meaning something that we create? Is it something that we, we cultivate? Um, and in some cases, particularly in the context of this course, is it something that we fabricate? You know, is it something that we simulate? And I guess the answer to that, is, well, it's not very clear, but it is, on the other hand, well, yes, to all of those things. Um, you know, I, I could speak from personal experience and I'm sure lots of people <clears throat> would agree that, you know, particularly in your teen, teen years, you might find meaning by going to nightclubs and having that collective ecstatic experience with people. Um, and in many ways, an experience like that has replaced, it's, you know, it's a congregation of sorts. Um, another huge source of meaning is is relationships and obviously, you know, that's one of the core, the core things we we kind of discuss at Advire and what the previous courses I've done have, have been really focused on is is relationship. Um, and that that's relationship of all kind, you know, there can be, we can find meaning in, in relationships and we can also be hurt by relationships and not all relationships, um, you know, forms of relationship will provide meaning and, and not all forms of relationships are healthy or created equal. So it's it's incredibly, incredibly broad. Um, and to say, oh, we need more meaning is it's 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 not, you know, it's not the end of that that question. Uh, it's, it's a door that's, that's being opened. Um, and I think the distinction that we'll make on this particular course is what are healthy sources of meaning and how can we cultivate more of those um and I think going back to the thing on do we create meaning that's something that has really come to the fore of a lot of conversations I've been in myself and have been sort of listening to over the past few years that humanity seems to be realizing that yes we do create meaning and oh we do have agency um, you know, we can use our imagination and our collective and individual agency to create something that is going to lead to flourishing. And that's really powerful. And that might actually uh, signal the kind of transition that's been happening from religion to, to a secular society, to a spiritual one, because religion is less about agency, whereas spirituality and I mean, we'll talk about because they're hard to separate, you know, they're one and the same. Um, but spirituality seems to give people more agency in their meaning making. You know, you're not told what to believe. You're not told what's meaningful. Instead, you are kind of provoked sometimes um, or prompted, that's a sort of less intense word, to go out and find it for yourself. Find out for yourself, think for yourself, feel for yourself. Um, and feel hopefully and think with with others as well. Um, so yeah, I guess just to wrap up that point, it's you know we live in a world where the dominant culture is trying to arrive at a conclusive, objective meaning meaning of life, but we're all subjective creatures with our subjective meanings. And so there's like almost a fundamental conflict or not necessarily conflict, like a contradiction that might not be able to be resolved. Um, but how do we navigate that? How do we navigate each of us having our own inner life that's separate from everybody else and then having the completely shared outer life? Um, actually, I don't agree with what I've just said. <laughs> Because because the um, this inner and outer distinction is obviously not black and white, is it? But maybe we could talk about that later. I think I think the the, the back and forth is actually really interesting that you that you just had with yourself because, um, I mean it it just it just goes to show that like there's really kind of a lot of tensions that exist within these things that we're talking about and all the more like it is important to to kind of un untangle that together and bringing kind of multiple perspectives into the conversation to kind of um, 
dissect all these very complicated things. Um, but to kind of step back from what you were talking about a little bit, um, I wanted to kind of focus on because I think I think you went a little bit into the religion and spirituality um, part, and I wanted to pull that out um, a little bit more. Uh, you know, I guess when when it's interesting to to say that we are going through a meaning crisis and that we are kind of people are losing a sense of or like the senses of meaning are eroding mm, in the transition from you know religion to spirituality. Um, I would love for you to kind of give us a little bit of context on what you were thinking when um, you kind of put together the course um, and and why I guess the, the distinctions between those two things which you were starting to talk about already you know kind of um, with a, a wider constructed you know meaning and then and, and like outer life and then something that's your own and kind of negotiated by yourself in community which is like kind of more spirituality I guess um yeah I mean I don't think that we'll arrive at an answer to this but I, I just kind of wanted to get your sensing of what you were hoping to disentangle through bringing those two things together in this course so so um <clears throat> kind of the how I perceive the, the distinctions and connections between religion and spirituality. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I um <laughs> in many ways, you know, to simplify it, there are two camps and each camp says, no, my way is the best way. And spiritual people will say, you know, religion is dogmatic, religion is the source of all war, um, religion oppresses certain groups. And then on the other side, you know, religions will say, well, spirituality, you know, there's not enough sort of commitment or devotion or it's too individualistic or, you know, the new age beliefs in particular are colonial and harmful. And so there's this, you know, that's always going on. And and my view is that um, neither is better than the other. You know, each has um, pros and cons. Um, Religion, you know, and again, just to add the caveat, I'm not, I'm not a theologian, um, and I'm not myself religious, and in many ways, I would say I'm not even spiritual, but I have a, um, a commitment to the mystical. Let's just put it that way. Um, though I have been through, you know, I went went to a Church of England school. I've I've grown up in a culture that is secular but still very Christian, you know, in, in, in Britain where I live, there's a, um, you know, almost like a hangover of Christianity. You know, the Christianity as an organized religion has um, declined. It's still very much here, but it's declined compared to what it used to be. But the core myths and metaphors of Christianity inform so much of Western culture. And we don't call it Christianity anymore, but it is, you know, that's that's a lot of where it comes from. You know, I felt very scarred by my experience with religion. Um, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll just say with Christianity, because I felt like the core myth, uh, you know, the story of Adam and Eve was sort of um, demonizing the body, demonizing pleasure, demonizing sensuousness, you know, and as someone who had str struggled with being disconnected from nature, being disconnected from my body, I thought, mm, this doesn't feel like it's going to help me. So I go to spirituality and I I meditate and I encounter all sorts of um, practices from different traditions, mostly Eastern traditions. And I think, okay, the answer is going to be the answer is going to be in here. And of course the answer is nowhere to be found. Um, and then I get involved in, you know, some problematic things like psychedelic tourism, the appropriation of, of psychedelic medicines from other cultures uh, without any, you know, kudos to that tradition whatsoever. And so I've been ricocheting between religion and spirituality thinking, <clears throat> well, hang on aren't these supposed to be the the places where we find meaning and why isn't this working? Um, and I've ended up at a place of peace, <laughs> um, sort of in between them. 
And on the one hand, I recognize that, and, and many others recognize that religion provides a deep history, it provides tradition, it provides an infrastructure for collective communing that spirituality perhaps doesn't provide in the same at the same depth. And also, you know, you don't have to read the news every day to see that particularly monotheistic religions are really coming up against their limitations in a globalized world because we've got multiple cultures with their traditions and beliefs interacting, which on the one hand is amazing because there's so much learning and exchange um, that comes from that. And on the other hand, if one person's God is better than the other person's God is better than the other person's God is and so on and so forth, there's going to come conflict will 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 come which is you know we're not just seeing it in this current moment is that's the whole history of of religion and, and cultures sort of mixing and it's not as black and white as that obviously um but that's just the general pattern so you have that side of things and then spirituality which you know it's not a um though it's coming to the fore in in kind of modern western culture again it's not a modern thing it's uh you know something like i know a lot of buddhists and they they you know from all over from all different walks of life which is one of the things that you know i love about buddhism is that it's really you know inclusive like that and they will say oh it's not a religion and say so what is it is it spirit is it spirituality like is it philosophy? <laughs> like, what, what is it? And there's no, people will obviously have different definitions of it, but that's one of the things that I really like about it. And I'm not a Buddhist either, but um, I find that really fascinating that it sort of evades the category and it has some elements of organized religion and it has elements obviously of spirituality. Um, and I feel like it might be, Perhaps I haven't, and perhaps I can't make a clear distinction between religion and spirituality because religion is spiritual. Um, <laughs> but then what is spiritual? It's like a connection to something broader than yourself, something outside of yourself that you can connect to individually and collectively. It's, it's, um, you know, the spirit means, you know, something in the ether, something that's not tangible. It's like the air, you know, it's this amorphous, metaphorically speaking, it's this amorphous thing that we can't quite grasp, but we can gesture at. Um, so I find that really, really fascinating because it sort of transcends physics and metaphysics. I mean, that's getting pretty abstract, but Basically, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I only have my own sense, very loose sense. Um, and I'm monologuing a bit, so please feel, feel free to interrupt me. Um. <laughs> no, I can, I can, I can cut you right there. And I, I, I'm, you know, I, I think kind of moving around a little bit in the order of the question, since we kind of landed a little bit on, on what is spirit and we started talking about the ether. Um, I... I think it's really interesting because the the kind of the idea of the sacred has really and you know we'll get into the thorny bits about this in a little bit but I think just to kind of talk more broadly about how how the sacred has kind of hit the mainstream um why you know not getting ahead of, of ourselves and not talking about the thorny bits first but kind of you know really wanting to focus on why um why this sort of the sacred has been such a like there has been such a revival of it um and and why what is it about spirituality like what is spirituality really and you know kind of going on in that though like um segue that you were already going into um yeah I think it's really interesting when you when you described um the realm of the spirit as like you know in ways that where we we still want to like love and ways that we want to like self-reflect and these that these things have you know like the spiritual has never really left us um 
and you know the, even the search for a community the search for a deeper relationships these are all kind of in search of the spirit in search of, of the secret um yeah i wonder if you could talk a, a little bit more um about that and your observations about how this is kind of gripped a lot of people now <laughs> The sacred has always been there, right? It's like even in a secular society, we revere things. We worship things. Um, we devote ourselves to things. We have faith in things. We believe in things that aren't us, that are bigger than us. We we believe in things that can't be proved. Um, and, you know, one thing I find particularly fascinating is the ways in which the sacred has been almost transplanted actually um from <clears throat> you know jesus to or you know choose your god to um beyonce you know or something something like this is you know celebrity there's been an apotheosis of of celebrity a, a deification of celebrity um and not just celebrity, you know, Elon Musk is another good example of, of someone who has been turned into a god. And so that that um, impulse to uh, attribute the sacred to lone figures is, is very much alive uh, in, in this culture, in Western culture particularly. Or let's just say modern culture, because it's more complex than that. Um, and this, the sacredness is like, <clears throat> what I find fascinating about the sacred is that it's, it goes hand in hand with the profane. And they're all always kind of pitched against each other, you know, sacred good, profane bad. And many people would say, oh, well, you know, modern Western culture or the consumerist culture or capitalist culture or whatever is extremely profane. You know, it's it's sinful if you look at it through the lens of, um, you know, traditional religions. Let's say that's very broad, but it's we are living in a time of deep, deep sin, um, and at the same time, liberation. You know, personal and and, and collective liberation, and sensual liberation, and, and so many different forms of liberation. So this idea of sacred and profane, I find really, really fascinating and actually Eddie Elsie will be touching on this a little bit in, in his session which is the second session of week one about demystifying spirituality and it, that doesn't mean demystifying as in taking the mystical out but it means it means understanding that the sacred is not this thing that's up here and it can't be touched and it's pure and it's out of reach um, and it's not, you know, not for the sinful. And the idea, on the other hand, that the profane is this awful thing only reserved for certain people. Um, you know, I love, love the yin-yang metaphor because it gets at the inherent paradox in this, in that the profane will contain elements of sacredness and vice versa. And again, as we sort of spoke about earlier, it's completely subjective. You know, I could look out of my window right now and I see a plant growing out of a concrete wall and I think, you know, that's so sacred. But then I think of the profanity of the industrious, like, concrete and the synthetic material. You know, it's just, you could go on and on with this. You know, the church used to be the home of the sacred and the home of the sacred has moved. You know, and I used the metaphor earlier of the sacred has been transplanted. It's like really important to understand that this this the sacred is still there. You know, the sacred cannot cannot be erased, um, but it also apparently cannot be agreed on because, you know, something like religion is saying we've got a consensus on the sacred. This is what the sacred is. This is what it means. And then some people are like, well, that's not sacred to me actually. What's sacred to me is my family, my pet, you know, what's sacred to me is cooking food or what's sacred to me is going outside or, you know, Formula One is sacred to me, you know, it's like so subjective. Um, and so obviously a lot of conflict arises when, when, when folks are sort of 
going at each other saying no mine is more sacred this is more sacred this is more sacred it's it's ultimately a an attempt to validate one's own existence in the world by saying my source of meaning is valid yours is not therefore my existence is valid um and i mean this can go off into all sorts of like political discussion but i'm not sure if that answered your question sorry i just <laughs> no, no, I, I just it's just interesting because i had kind of a lot of thoughts kind of building off of that um specifically i think referencing clementine Mar mm. um the the kind of um what you were getting at about that sort of like disagreement and um trying to well I mean I guess you know I would I would love for you to to talk a little bit about that the inclusion of that session actually to kind of ground what you were saying a little bit um working across our differences why you decided to put um that that session in and then but also tell us a bit about why the inclusion of the session kind of gets at the spirit of what we're trying to do with this course in general you know mm. yeah yeah I'm really looking forward to the the session on um I can't remember the full title I think it's from well it's about solidarity and integrity um and it's about kind of trying to work together across our differences um and you know anyone that's taken any advice courses previously will know that actually it's uh, you know and they'll know that difference is our strength and that difference and diversity is what makes life life and what allows us to to relate when it comes to religion and spirituality depending on who what where when and you know the current sort of political climate we're in it's often appears to be uh, a competition of, of people sort of asserting their particular god or belief system or practice or tradition or moral purity essentially um and who deserves to go to heaven and, and so on and so forth obviously this creates conflict um because people have different beliefs um and at the root of most religions and spiritual traditions is the basic belief that you know we should be good humans we should be kind to each other you know love love thy neighbor and we're seeing a lot of hate thy neighbor happening in the world um so it doesn't appear to be working something in both religion and spirituality the whole melting pot does not appear to be working um it's not helping us relate it's it's not helping us um not even move beyond our differences but but relate through our differences become through our differences make meaning through our differences so i thought it would be interesting to include a session on that um as a kind of antidote to the the impulse that humans have to form into into sects and of course we'll always form into groups we'll always form into tribes but that doesn't necessarily mean that we form into vacuums um and push away you know like two magnets opposing each other everything on on the outside um spirituality in particular is coming to be known as something that's very individualistic and it's very about the private private inner life uh, not that religion doesn't have that too but religion is often about congregation and and meeting together for prayer and, and so on spirituality seems to be more about journeying you know through consciousness itself um so that obviously has an impact on how we how we come into relation with others if we're so you know the term is often used this navel gazing if we're just navel gazing and sort of meditating and pushing the world outside that is going to reduce our sort of not even tolerance like our our, our sort of um, relational skills, like our ability to come out of ourselves to be in, in relation with others. So when spirituality becomes focused too much on the individual, it also allows people to cultivate a quite extreme level of entitlement. Like I'm going to speak my truth 
so your truth is therefore you know invalid or lesser than um and we're seeing this a lot and i mean it comes to the fore particularly in internet culture where people will be fighting in the comments about you know who's who's in a world is more valid or, or whatnot um yeah i don't i don't know <laughs> yeah no, no no i think i think you know where this is leading is 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 then what um you know if 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 it's not if it's not kind of and we'll return to i think that question you know talking about um new gods in modernity in a little bit which will probably be easier to talk through but i think you know we're coming up against such difficulty trying to trying to ground it because this is what the course is supposed to do and, and we're trying to you know talk it out between two of us right i don't think you know two of our brains can can come and kick him at some kind of conclusive answer but um you know i i think um this what's coming out to me is is is, is that you know one might read this course description and think that you know we're just slamming religion and 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 that you know and that spirituality is 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 somewhat better um but from what you're saying you know it it sounds obviously to be much more nuanced than that and and it's like you know there are specific things about about religion and, and the way it brings people together that that we can you know cultivate and and that you know that journeying of the individual um cultivating the spirit and spirituality is also something that we want to keep um and is there a way that we can kind of bring those things together in this time without being problematic being respectful but also you know negotiating something new and and what does it take for everyone along across this whole spectrum to come together and be like okay well you know how do we get to that healthier form of whatever we're trying to or of like you know deriving meaning and and cultivating meaning for ourselves and for the people around us in community whatever um you know, I'm I'm wondering, you know, what are your preliminary thoughts, just to wrap this kind of very <laughs> amorphous conversation, um, like, what are your thoughts on, just preliminarily, uh, on, on, like, what it means to come to a healthier form of this, and what, what will it, what will it take, really, is it, is it just, you know, people coming together but even if people come together it doesn't necessarily mean that we can have constructive conversations because a lot of these things are very you know understandably very sacred very like um key to our identity so you know not wanting to compromise or negotiate on that so you know what what could what could really you know help alleviate this these problems my immediate feeling is something even bigger than religion or spirituality um you know and then what's, what's that that's like met meta metaphysics um but what i'm thinking of i'm actually i'm thinking of the climate crisis partly because it's something that we're all entangled in it's something that is going to have a tangible material effect on all of us no matter where we are no matter what we believe in it doesn't matter. It's, it's a thing. Um, you know, and in many ways it is, it is mobilizing people because it's, when I say it's tangible and material, I don't therefore mean that religion and spirituality isn't more that. I really want to make this, um, I get very, per I get, I've got a chip on my shoulder about this, as you probably know, when people say that what's abstract is not real, because what's abstract, even if it is floating around in the social imaginary and the realm of metaphysics and philosophy and language and semantics, it's having material consequences. It is affecting our cellular organism it is affecting the way we eat it is affecting having children you know it's it's really physical um even if it's not physical um which is <clears throat> which is something that i find really fascinating you know we've we've moved from the kind of i think therefore i am split between mind and matter and we're coming back 
to a place in the culture where that is becoming unclear again. And we're saying, oh, actually, you know, there's a reason why so many people are working on narrative work, changing the social narratives, because actually narratives have material consequences and outcomes, and they are very tangible. Imagination is very tangible. So that's a bit of a sidetrack. <laughs> but what I was talking about before was, um, yeah, what's what what's going to help us across these these conflicts and divides? What makes communities strong, in my experience, is a um, a common challenge, and that common challenge is climate climate change. There are lots of other common common challenges as well, and you know, lots of people might say, "Well, actually, have you not thought about this? And have you not thought about this? And that climate change is just one of many crises in the poly crisis." But it really is the most prevalent one I can think of that unites us all, and it's something that we can all collectively work towards. Um, and if ever, you know, if ever the climate collapse if, if you could call it that climate change or whatever people want to call it in my life <clears throat> even though it's an immense source of suffering it's also an immense source of meaning because suddenly in this morass of like a plasticized culture and of separation suddenly there's something that we can agree on suddenly there's something that we can work on together. Suddenly, my life, I'm aware of my mortality. We're all aware of our mortality. And we're, you know, particularly aware of our children's mortality and of the future of humanity's mortality. I couldn't think of a greater source of meaning and a greater cause to act for. Um, so... <clears throat> Yeah, I mean that's the that's that's the answer. Like a, a a bigger shared problem that transcends transcends the minutiae of particular religious and spiritual um, belief systems. Pivoting uh, away from the very complicated discussion for which we have no answer to, um, I think you know something that we'll spend quite a lot of weeks on is. Um, the other things that have taken the place of, you know, speaking of like narrative work, but taking the place of the collapsing narratives that have happened, like, you know, we've are beginning to see like a very different era of like gods and worship. And, you know, these, as you point out in the sessions are like, you know, materialism, science as a dogma, celebrity, like you were talking about earlier, even atheism, like not even having a god. Um, you know, why I, I would love for you to talk us a bit through these, um, you know, and it's a big ask, but um, I guess more in the sense of like talking about a little bit of the sessions, like some of the sessions that, that these are about, and also why kind of talking about these things are important in our kind of inquiry journey through spirituality you know because I think this is more than a cultural or like anthropological almost analysis of of the of the issue and not necessarily about you know religion or spirituality itself um yeah it's kind of a can of worms but <laughs> respond as you wish <laughs> <laughs> um that's a really good way of putting it actually it is it's it's it is like a cultural and anthropological analysis but it's almost it's, it's almost not analysis you know i wrote something the other day saying um well and you've just said it opening a can of worms we're just opening a can well we're not just opening a can of worms like you know everyone will learn something um it's just a case of what there is no sort of curriculum of like okay you will learn this precise thing about spirituality um you know, and fortunately, we're living in a time where where people are seeing the value in asking questions rather than always seeking answers. You know, it's a, a mode of knowledge production, to put it rather dryly, that is um, generative and and healthy. 
we've already touched on the apotheosis of celebrities. So, you know, example, Beyonce and Elon Musk um, and the sort of deification of particularly tech, tech guru. I mean, they're called tech gurus. A guru is, you know, supposed to be a source of spiritual guidance and wisdom. And, um, you know, lots of people are saying, well, you know, Mark Zuckerberg is that. And I'm sort of thinking, um, I don't know about that. You know, I don't I don't know if I necessarily agree. Um, so there's there's the example of celebrity, you know, replacing um, the Messiah in many ways. There's the example of what well, we've mentioned, tech gurus, but also just technology in general. Um, technology itself seems to be viewed as a kind of not only as a form of godliness, um, but as something that will give us godliness. You know, transhumanism is particularly interesting because it the basic idea is that by um, kind of adorning ourselves with various technological you know, microchips and becoming cyborgs, that we will develop more godlike powers. This is obviously very... Um, both interesting and troubling at the, at the same time. Um, and we could go off on a whole conversation about that. That's a whole separate thing. Then there's the the idea of, um, you know, science. I mean, it's it's been for a long time that science has basically replaced religion as, as a way of knowing. I mean, religion, spirituality, science, philosophy, whatever, they're all attempts at knowing. That's like the basic logic of, of 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 what they are, knowing or understanding. I mean, and there's a whole conversation in there that we won't go into about the difference between knowledge and wisdom and understanding. Um, so you've got science, which yeah has has, has sort of placed uh, religion in many ways and is coming up against its limitations, <clears throat> and that's why I think it's important to talk about this, to talk about okay, we've we've substituted and we've transplanted the sacred and meaning and religion and all of these things. And we've, we've got this modern context of um, science, technology, and something like consumerism is almost a kind of religion. Um, the, the ways in which people consume have become, you know, my, myself included in this, have become, you know, people become devoted to a brand. You know, a brand is like almost like a god to some people. Um, people congregate in the Nike store. You know, it's like for the for the latest release of that thing. Um, so it, that to me signals that there is an impulse. There is there is an inherent impulse that's just always there, and it doesn't. It's not a bad thing. You know, when I see people devoting themselves to consumerism yes it's a bad thing in terms of the environment and, and what it does to people ultimately but if you wanted to look at the positive side of that you could say people have the capacity to devote themselves people have the capacity to have faith people have the capacity to believe in something other though I will say and this appears a lot in traditional religions as well and, and spirituality that these modern <clears throat> god substitutes their icons you know they they operate on the same logic that an, that an icon or a symbol operates on and we say okay this stands for that this means that but it's not the thing in and of itself um, and our our icon making impulses have really sort of, sort of run away, um, and often, you know, we will look towards an icon, but we won't look towards each other. You know, we we give up our agency to whatever this icon is, whether it's you know the god of consumerism, the tech guru, the celebrity, um, you know, even the rock star scientist. You know, we've got those two. We've got we've got rock star psychologists. We've got rock star scientists now, which is really interesting. Not again, not necessarily a bad thing. One of the key reasons I I wanted to convene this course was lots of people are saying actually we shouldn't have become secular. 
we we should have religion we need we need these places um you know they're the they're the sort of a well of meaning for us and it was a bad idea to to you know abandon religion and then on the other hand lots of people are saying <clears throat> yes but we need um sorry yes but religion is really really bad and it's done these really really bad things and so there's there's this tension point this transition point that we're in where we're, it's almost like we're trying to salvage the good parts of religion <clears throat> and adapt it to contemporary society which is in part what this course is about it's like I'm obviously we're doing that but how and is it is it working and I find it particularly fascinating I don't, I don't know if you've noticed this but there's this huge resurgence in an in, in interest in Christianity um, and like a green version of Christianity or like you know extracting the kind of the pagan folk aspects of Christianity and um yeah salv salvaging it and I find this completely fascinating and I wonder how um how successful that's going to be you know I see a lot of people in my generation so millennials who have completely you know athe atheist or agnostic or spiritual but barely any are kind of religious in the traditional sense of the word and suddenly in the last year even as you know societal problems have been intensifying I'm noticing a lot of people in my networks, you know, my age groups between 20, 30, 40, saying, you know what, I'm going to be Christian or I'm going to be, I'm I'm going to, you know, take up Islam or whatever. And they, it's such a strange turn from such intense atheism and, and materialism and trust and faith and belief in science and tech to 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 go back or to remember or to invoke these things that, you know, we, my generation, once thought were incredibly toxic. And I'm just very curious about that. Yeah, just to say, I think I've noticed it as well. And, you know, definitely like in advice space, I feel like there's, you know, just within our community alone, there's definitely a lot of people who are interested in the question of um, how do we kind of, I guess, reconcile um, religion and environmentalism and eco-spirituality that you know we are also talking about in the course and I do also find it really fascinating the way in which these people are not necessarily trying to um I guess like they're not trying to reject the fact that these religions have caused a lot of harm and done a lot of terrible things um, and continue to do so today but um, that, that that you can still kind of like you said salvage that and still find um, meaning and, and I mean you know in 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 this at this point in time like what hasn't been ruined and what hasn't done some amount of damage or some amount of harm there really isn't very much to that is like purely good, you know, and so and so maybe the, the the really the question is how we if we have we have to if we take the premise that we have to kind of salvage these things because they're all not pure anymore, not purely good. Then how do we kind of salvage that? And and that's I guess a question that I'm curious to be to be learning about on the course. Um, and I guess another thing that's it's coming up for me is that like, you know. I guess the people who are watching, if like you are interested in or confused about why, you know, people care about this thing or that thing or why why people derive meaning from this thing or that thing. And then, you know, noticing the different ways in which people are deriving meaning now and trying to kind of find ways to coherently move together through that and work through our differences then you know this is kind of the place to come and listen and sort out what those questions could be um and yeah it, it's a safe space because in this space we're also acknowledging all of the kind of difficult um, parts that we can't reject from these things that we are trying to salvage um and, and on that note i also want to spend a little bit of time um 
I guess we're we're coming to the close also of this conversation, but you know, spending a little bit of time about the the thorny bits and the difficult um parts. And this is, you know, specifically referring to um I guess this the sessions on on um tokenizing the sessions on you know importing spirituality from the east to the west again not as simple as that sounds um but also you know about find refinding localized forms of spirituality that are local to the west um and also i guess that bit about um the psychedelic space and how that's also very really wrapped up in the whole you know tokenization um and yeah which we, we've begun to touch on just now but I guess I the question is how are we making space to are we making space to discuss that and how are we um yeah making space to discuss that and and, and out of curiosity you know do you personally feel that like does it does it make you less want to go into these spaces knowing that there's a lot of kind of harm and problematic behavior happening you know especially I think when you when you mention your reservations in the psychedelic space I'm also a bit curious about that um yeah and, and how do we engage people in conversations like this without entirely being like well you're cancelled you know yeah <laughs> yeah so there are lots of thorns in these topics, um, particularly to do with the the appropriation of um, different sort of spiritual traditions from from places outside of you know. And we're we're, we're talking about the West here. This is this is a, a sort of Western crisis, but I do want to add that I feel the West is no longer a um, it exists and it's a thing, but it's it's much more complex than that. And I'm I'm almost starting to talk about just modernity itself, because you know the Western culture is no longer in the West. Western culture is bloody everywhere. Um, but anyway, that's a side thing. Um, so this this idea that you know there's a kind of we can exchange spiritually we can exchange practices we can exchange exchange literature we can exchange um you know we can travel to peru to to drink ayahuasca with shapibo shaman or we can travel to um you know like t tibet to go and meditate in a buddhist monastery or we can you know we can kind of have that experience and there's there's nothing inherently wrong in that or harmful in that it's the, the attitude with which it's done right and I know I've been part of this problem myself where spirituality becomes you know there's there's such a thing as spiritual tourism which then becomes spiritual colonialism if not conducted with care and this seems to come from the idea that um western cultures do not have their own forms of spirituality or um you know robust forms of meaning that they therefore must go out and seek and then take other uh you know forms of spirituality from other people and places i mean that's just colonialism um and it's also not true because there's tons of you know healthy religious and spiritual history um in western cultures and we'll, we'll be touching on that um, and I think it's really important to talk about appropriation because there's so much nuance in it to do with kind of spiritual cultural exchange and where is the line, um, you know, where does it become, where does it become harmful for people and how are we, how do we figure that out? How do we feel it? And how do we, how do we discuss this with sort of care? So it kind of links to this idea that spirituality is something abstract but actually spirituality a lot of the time is something that's very rooted to place a very specific place um and to, to try and take that kind those kind of teachings and 
sever them from their place, move them halfway across the world and expect them to work in the same way is possibly misguided. You know, one example of this is, um, you know, the idea that if if we all just drank ayahuasca, then it would be, we'd all be fine and we'd have this collective enlightenment and we'd fix all of our problems. I'm not saying that's not necessarily true, but it would be an interesting thing to happen. But, you know, ayahuasca is, is made of plants that come from the Amazon rainforest, a very particular part of the Amazon rainforest, and the brew is only possible because of particular place-based knowledge with particular people. Does that therefore mean it needs to stay private within um, that sort of uh, community forever? No, not necessarily. You know, cultures survive by connecting and exchanging with each other. That's that that's relating. Um, you know, if we all lived in vacuums and kept our our knowledge to ourselves and our traditions and our practices to ourselves, I'm not sure what type of world we would live in. It might be even more sort of depressing than what we're going through now. Um, but yeah, there is this other this other side of it. Um, and obviously I've just spoken about psychedelics so maybe I'll go a bit more into that. But there's been this huge resurgence of interest in psychedelics. And I think, you know, the last sort of psychedelic renaissance was in the 60s or 70s, around about that time. Um, and Alexander Biner will be talking about this specifically, the, sh the shift that we're going through from, from the psychedelic renaissance to the psychedelic enlightenment. Um, and personally speaking, I, I felt like I was sort of riding the wave of the, the psychedelic renaissance, you know, I was getting involved in cultural events around it, research around it, going to retreats, you know, trying different um, psychedelics, plant medicines in different contexts, in different cultural, spiritual, religious containers, um, very much in a kind of seeking energy. And at the time, I thought, yeah, this is it. This is this is the answer. You know, it's had such a profound impact on me. It must have a profound impact on others, which it clearly has. However, um, you know, a few years later, I thought maybe, maybe this isn't the right way. Maybe, you know, I'm I'm drinking ayahuasca with that zero knowledge of where it or who it's come from, zero knowledge of its history of its um you know like even mythological significance of the, of the cultural narratives that surround it all of this stuff no just completely abstracted from its context you know drink ayahuasca then go out into the the sort of modern western consumerist capitalist world whatever you want to call it unable to integrate because something's not right something's not matching the context is off so at the same time as this psychedelic renaissance was happening, new ageism, you know, it's always been there, but it's, it was increasing in its kind of, you know, it, it is still a subculture, but it was increasing its kind of impact. And um, myself included, lots of people were getting sucked into that. And what is new ageism? It's so many things, you know, it, it's, it's not, I would say new age thought and belief is more of a um, a quality of something rather than its own sect. Um, and a lot of the, the sort of ideas in new age subcultures are very liberating. You know, they're very interesting to the individual who wants to really go into their inner world. But there's also a lot of thorny issues like the appropriation of... Um, other cultures, traditions, and the idea that we can pass it off as our own and say, no, we, you know, we discover this, we have access to this, this, this is ours now. And actually we, we got to this discovery first. That's just not true. Um, so, you know, there'll be some, some discussion on that as well. Um, whilst also acknowledging that, you know, we should exchange, but how do we exchange? Um, and so a shift, that I'm seeing from this sort of appropriation <clears throat> of other cultures, spiritual traditions is, is and the, the thing we spoke about Christianity is related to this, is like digging where we stand. So what spiritual traditions do we have here already underneath the layers of consumerism, underneath the layers of colonialism that we can um, 
repair really and and revive christianity is one of them which is not without its problems which we will discuss um but also you know just folk culture in general and, and sort of pagan beliefs that are also you know very panpsychist this idea that consciousness is in everything um which is also animist obviously there's just lots of words for the same thing basically so related to what we were talking about earlier about the kind of deification of the individual and the apotheosis of the celebrity something that i'm also seeing a lot of is um the fetishization of indigenous people and indig indigenous cultures um and you know with that the appropriation and the tokenization that comes with this and the basic idea is that because um western cultures are outwardly facing so devoid of sort of spiritual wisdom that we must therefore go to indigenous cultures and say hey what do you know of course what often happens in that dynamic is that you know there's no reciprocity the exchange is based on extracting knowledge when the thing that we're really engaging with is wisdom you can't extract wisdom you can't consume wisdom but we live in a culture where you know we've romantic we've romanticized that and when you romanticize something you sh you strip it of its of its own aliveness because it's a projection of what you 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 want it to mean or you want it to say and so this is obviously really um a really sort of damaging pattern that's happening at the moment and i guess the challenge is like how can we we learn from certain indigenous cultures um you know and and allow that knowledge and that wisdom in the context of spirituality to relate with the knowledge and wisdom of this place and not get into a dynamic where one cancels the other out or one is more superior to the other because in that case we're just re-entering you know we're master's tools master's house kind of thing i just want to emphasize that it's a very ambitious course so it really covers a lot of the the bits of spirituality and the, and you kind of went over a lot of the very problematic aspects of of what we will be kind of trying to disentangle um and you could we could obviously go on and on about it but that's why the course is as it is with this many teachers and over this many weeks um so it makes perfect sense that it will be kind of a sprawling thing and again we're opening up a can of worms and I don't think that the <laughs> I don't think that the answer would be you know organized in any way um but I think you know I think that's that's a good place to close actually um you know and we have kind of come to a point where we have more questions than answers always um but I think what we've done here is kind of really opened the inquiry and kind of just briefly touched on a bit of the big questions and also some of the small questions um and you know the conclusive answers will come for each person as they go through the course so I don't think that you know um this conversation is kind of only the beginning of what we're getting into um and yeah I mean I just wanted to wrap also by by saying that this this course is really carefully structured um Hannah as you kind of already began began to talk us through um and if people are curious about about each each week's kind of breakdown there's you know two sessions in in each week um and so we have I think a total of 12 maybe now 14 including um extra lectures um but 14 teachers who will be guiding us through this very um nebulous and hard to pin down <laughs> inquiry um in which everyone will come with their own set of questions and their own answers I guess um and the yeah, I mean, I, I think people should be prepared to to be held in a, in a collective inquiry that is in the spirit of, of finding more questions than answers, and also in the spirit of coming together in a very messy way, um, without while respecting each other's kind of different opinions, and also being willing to come together to find something that can only be found when we're together. Um, don't know if that made sense, but you know that that kind of feels like an important caveat to say for this course. Um, 
and the course runs in 2024, I think February, February, yeah, we're starting just a day before Valentine's Day. Um, on Tuesdays, um, Tuesday evenings, UK time. And um, yeah, it's, it's open for registration and inviting everyone who has listened to this conversation who has found all these um, points of lines of inquiry interesting to sign up, but also to write in if you have any questions and if you would like to know more about some of the things that maybe weren't covered during this conversation, do write in and we can pass your inquiries on to Hannah, who can also maybe answer those questions if you have any. Um, it's it's nebulous, but expansive. It's like, you know, when I hear the word nebulous, I think of a cloud expanding outwards. And that's kind of how I how I how I see this course, which I find, you know, it's funny to call it a course in 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 some way. I really am thinking of it as a gathering. And as you say, collective inquiry. Um, but you know, it's a, a place to show up with with curiosity um and just the desire to ask questions. You know, it's not, you know, if you're in seeking mode, which I suppose we all are to some extent, there, you know, some things will some points will get closure and other points will just be you know the knot will become further more entangled and I guess it's almost a spiritual practice in some way to be with that and to accept accept the lack of conclusion um and to be excited by by the conversation um and by all of the really interesting stuff that's going to come out of it I'm very excited but I'm biased obviously <laughs> Amazing. Thank you, Hannah. And Thank we'll you. see you all on the course. <laughs>